Hi, everybody. Welcome to ANN in Depth. I'm so excited to have you here with us today. We're going to be talking about something that is really important to me and really important, I think, to, to so many people. And that is when we are not feeling like the Lord is with us, when we're not feeling like he's near us, how do we reconnect with him and how are we sure of his presence in our lives? And today, Sam was here. Um, we had a wonderful conversation with Sam and with Jill Marconi from 3ABN. And I just know that you are going to watch this program and you are gonna you're gonna feel something special about it because I think it was a really special conversation. And of course with Jill and Sam both, we delved into the Lord, word of the Lord. And so we hope that you will enjoy this conversation and that it will mean something to you as much as it meant to us. Um, so enjoy and as always, we are praying for you. Please let us know how we can continue to pray for you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Anne and in depth. I am happy to be here today with Sam and Jill Marconi. Jill, thank you so much for joining Sam and I on this conversation. Thank you so much. Welcome back. <laughs> Privilege to be we, with both of you again. We love having you here. Um, today, we're going to talk about how to trust God beyond our feelings. And um, this is such a a wonderful topic and as we were kind of talking before the program we both you know we all realized how many aspects of this there are so i'm excited to have this conversation and hopefully leave people not only with hope but some practical tips that they can use if they feel like they've been separated from the lord or they're not hearing him or if they are maybe not inclined to feel god's presence all the time and what that could mean and things that they could do to move forward so i'm really excited to have this conversation with Jill and with Sam today. I think it's necessary. So as we as we got talking, um, or as we start talking, there are a lot of reasons why we don't maybe don't feel the Lord with us. And I want to talk about them kind of separately, because I what I don't want people to do is misunderstand any of us during this, this talk. And you know, we say something like sin separates us from the Lord. So if you don't hear the Lord speaking to you, you might want to examine why, because, you know, that might not be the case. Some of us are in deep relationship with God and we still feel like we don't hear him or see him. So I want to start with saying that um, for those of us who maybe feel like they don't feel the God's presence all the time, and maybe we're reading our Bible, maybe we're studying our Bible, maybe every day we're going to the Lord. What, what, but we don't feel, and we're, we feel like God's asking us to move. We, we feel like, you know, we need to do something to rejuvenate this relationship what we have with him. Maybe if Jill, we'll start with you. If you could tell me like, what are the first steps? Cause I'm sure really our relationship with God is an ebb and a flow. You know, sometimes it's, that we feel more and sometimes we don't. When I'm feeling or, or you're feeling, or if somebody comes to you and they say, I'm just not feeling connected, what is what are some of the things that you tell them first? Yeah, I just want to say at the outset, this is actually yeah. one of my favorite topics. So I am so oh, delighted good. just talking together with both of you. Um, I have always been a feeling-based Christian. What I mean by that is if I would wake up in the morning and I got my Bible here on my desk, get my Bible out and spend that time. But, you know, sometimes when you pray, you talk to God and you feel like your prayers hit the ceiling and then they bounce mm -hmm. down like it never made it to God. There's times in my experience with God, my journey with him, that I would wake up and I would pray, God, I give you my heart today and I want to serve you. And it felt like he didn't hear me for whatever reason. There's been times that I asked forgiveness. God, would you forgive me for this? And I didn't feel forgiven. Those were times in my experience where then I would say, well, then I must not be forgiven. If I felt that my prayer didn't make it to heaven, then clearly God didn't hear me. If I don't feel somehow connected with God, then somehow God must not be there. And so those were times in my experience um, that I learned a valuable lesson. And I, I don't want to say that I've have this lesson learned all the time because clearly um, 
there's times I still go back into that feeling based. Yeah. I think life is a journey and our father in heaven is gracious and love and merciful. And um, the things we put on ourselves, he doesn't put on us. So, yeah. but in my own journey, to answer your question, the practical aspect of it in my own journey, I discovered that my walk with Jesus is not based on how I feel. It's mm -hmm. based on the power of the word of God. When I discovered that forgiven, what does it say? It says, all I have to do is confess and he will forgive. That's a guarantee. That's a promise. Now, of course, it's conditional. You have to confess. Then the forgiveness comes. But yeah. I think there's so many promises in the word. And when I discovered that, when I found that um, I could claim those promises and it didn't matter if I felt different. It didn't matter if I prayed and I felt like he heard me. I knew that his word is true. I have experienced it in my life before and that I can trust his word again. And when I trust his word, that eventually he brings my feelings around. So if I were to distill it down, the two things that have helped me the most in my journey, the first is just the word of God, taking the word of God as is, not trying to filter it by my feelings, but just taking what the word says about me and believing that and claiming that. That's been huge in my experience. The second thing that's been big in my experience is actually praise. Mm. Praise has been transformational. You know, if you read the word of God, <clears throat> I'm thinking of Second Chronicles chapter 20. There's Jehoshaphat. And the uh, I think it was the Moabites and the Ammonites. They were coming against the children of Judah. And you know, he's on his face before God. What am I supposed to do? And, you know, these people, these heathen nations coming against us are so powerful and, well, I can't do anything. But there's a really huge, to me, uh, verse in there. It says, when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against them. So what that tells me is that praise makes Satan flee. The way I look at it in our Christian walk, that God wants to be connected with us. That's his goal. He wants that unity. Remember he had with Adam and Eve in the beginning and sin brought disharmony. Sin brought separation from God. So he sent Jesus to reconcile us back to the father, to bring us back into that right relationship. And he wants that. But yet Satan does everything he can to thwart that. Satan does everything he can to separate us from God, to make us feel that we're not forgiven, to make us feel that we can't be loved, to make us feel that we can't walk in peace. And so I think praise is pivotal in the life of a Christian. When we praise, the enemy flees. You think of Paul and Silas, you know, in the uh, Philippi jail, singing and praising and what happened? God shows up. You know, it's just incredible in the midst of dark circumstances, when you least want to do it. And when you yeah. say, no, the, the last thing, you know, I just want to have a pity party, God, right now, or I want to go and cry. But if I make a choice to praise, God shows up in miraculous ways. That's really awesome. I'm not someone who feels my faith often, you know, I'm not like, you know, Sam and I, we, you know, I was saying to Jill, Sam before this, I was like, this is, I think something that women struggle with is when we don't feel our, we don't feel God and what that means. I was like, although I was like, if you look at Sam and I, Sam, I would say that you are probably more emotional than I am and enthusiasm when we talk about enthusiasm and all sorts of different ways. So I don't want to generalize this, but there are That's times a very accurate statement. Yes. I, <laughs> yeah. I, it's hard for me not to cry in a movie and that, that leads you to that. I'm, yeah, I'm very emotional. <laughs> but there are times when I've actually prayed, Lord, just help me feel something, you know, like, because I, I hear, and, you know, because, you know, we work for the church, all three of us work for the church and we hear beautiful stories. And sometimes as lifelong Christians, especially, you know, lifelong Adventists, 
we don't have that same conversion story. We don't have that same moment where God hit us over the head, you know? And there are times when I'm like, I just want to, you know, like feel something, you know, like I know you're with me. I like, you know, I go through this thing. I, I think, okay, I believe in the Lord. I know he's with me. I know he's acting on my behalf. I know he's working in my life, but I don't really feel that right now. And that's, that's hard even for somebody who isn't necessarily controlled by emotion or their feelings, because even even those of us who may be a little bit more practical, we still want to feel those feelings. And I think what's hard sometimes is, you know, where you were talking about praise and in those times when you just are like, I don't really feel like praising, this is a lot going on right now. That stepping out in faith and saying, God is asking me to praise him anyway. And I, I wonder like Jill and Sam, I'd love to hear both of you talk about this is intention. Like if I don't intend like if my intention isn't like that feeling, if I don't feel that praise, does God, or God still honor my action? You know, mm-hmm. and I think that's sometimes hard for me to like reckon, you know, because I don't feel like praising you. My intention is not like, great. I just, I'm acting so I feel it later, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm taking the step in faith that you're going to bring that to me later. You know, the blessing will come. And so where does intention come in? I, I guess for me, I, I feel like God would honor that. Because he knows I want to get there. <laughs> I'm just not so there yet. There. I'm doing it because he asked me. There is so much yeah. in that question. Um, <laughs> there were some ancient rabbis that used to say, you don't have to believe in God. Just do what he says. <laughs> Which is an interesting concept. And what they meant by that is, if you do what God says, you will end up believing in God. Yeah. It is inevitable. It's the, I don't understand it, but I will do it. Mm-hmm. I have a... 10 year old who is in this phase of life that he seems to believe that until he understands what the reason for my order is, he does not need to obey it. Mm. And he's very wrong I about feel that. It. And I'm wondering, I feel it. First, there is the authority that tells you to do something. And if people have authority over you, such as a father to a son, the son should do it, uh, whether they understand it or not. Then comes the, I understand what I'm doing, but I don't feel like doing it. And then comes the, I understand what I'm doing and I am doing it, even though I don't feel like doing it. And eventually it turns out that you do enjoy whatever it is that you are doing because you find new purpose in it. Our feelings are very fickle. You can, mm. I am so glad that my wife's love for me is not dependent on her feelings because sometimes I drive her crazy. And and so, but it's not. Her love for me is not dependent on her feelings. It's dependent on decisions that she made. The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hollywood says where your heart is, Mm -hmm. you should put your treasure. Those two are very opposing views. And they, they both try to describe reality. One of them is right. The other one, less so. Well, which yeah, is and the it? Bible says your heart is deceitful beyond measure. Right. You know, I mean, your feelings are deceitful. Your the way we feel is not true all the That's time. Right. They right. we feel good, we feel bad. It's based on circumstance, not on. It depends on if if you want to know the if how fickle feelings are, just measure a regular child from morning mm-hmm. till evening. If they are tired, they feel awful. If they are hungry, they feel differently about it. And so you have our feelings rely on our biology, on our environment, on our education, on how our parents treated us. There are so many things that our feelings uh, are influenced by that you really don't want reality to be defined by your feelings. You want reality to be separate and different from your feelings. What is that reality? Look, if you were to take the Bible and you were to remove every page where a servant of God who had a relationship with God felt alone and abandoned by God, it would be a much shorter book. Mm. Which means that we have a long history of inspired text showing us that men and women of God also felt alone, also felt that God wasn't listening, also felt the disconnection from God, 
Was God ever disconnected from them? No, it's their feeling. One more thing, coming back to what Jill was saying, which I thought was brilliant. When Jesus spent 40 days in the desert and he was tempted by the devil, a lot of people believe that that was about food. It wasn't. Before he went to the desert, he was taken to the desert by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. So the Holy Spirit is the one who brought him to the desert. There is another sermon there somewhere. We're not going to go there. But the last words that Jesus heard, one of the last words that Jesus heard before he went to the desert voluntarily were the words from God telling him, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. God's word was heard by Jesus. That's right. And God's word said that Jesus was his son. The first word he heard by the devil 40 days later after he is hungry. I mean, 40 days. I've, I've done, my record is 75 hours of fasting. Honestly, after 36 hours, the hunger is gone. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. But anyway, after 40 days, I believe that you are hungry. That's, <laughs> that could be a biological determination. You don't have to be a scientist or a doctor to determine that after 40 days without eating, you're going to be hungry. You are going to be feeling very differently to what you're feeling now. The devil comes to Jesus and says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Notice he wanted a magic trick, but the challenge was not the feeling of hunger. Jesus had to determine his feelings versus the word of God. That's right. Mm. That is the temptation. The first temptation is what we go through all the time. God, you say this about me. Yeah. But I don't feel it. Well, what are you going to choose? Which reality are you going to choose? Are you going to allow your feelings to determine your reality? Or are you going to uh, allow God's word to determine your reality? Which is what Jill said brilliantly. Right. This is always our temptation, day in and day out. There is a difference in the Psalms. The Psalms does not, very few Psalms, almost none of them say, I am abandoned. Mm -hmm. They say, I feel abandoned. And the, the Hebrew is even better in the song. Because you need to acknowledge your feelings. That's really important. Don't pretend like they're not there. Like, God, I feel like you're not listening. Right? Yeah. I feel like my guilt is taking over my, my whole being. In fact, it's no longer guilt. I feel shame. And I've been praying about this for years. And I still feel the shame. The reality of God's forgiveness is not based on your feelings that's right and this is right. so difficult because some of us it's are so hard more sensitive to negative emotion than others which is a psychological some would say biological trait some are right. more sensitive to negative emotion than others my wife is very sensitive to negative emotion for example not a day goes by in her life that she does not imagine the whole family dead mm -hmm sensitivity to negative emotion and she lives well with it it's like okay let's put our seatbelts on and in her mind she sees the car crash the blood the whole thing in a split second and then she comes does everybody have their seatbelt on people that have more sensitivity to negative emotion they see more risks than others at the same time they are more likely to feel all the negative potential in every situation yeah which means that this is you this is what who god made you to be um, you, you need to live that out and you should not trust your feelings no matter what. The opposite is also true. Some people have very little sensitivity to negative emotion. And they start doing things that God said not to do. And they don't feel bad about it. So, you know, it must be fine. Your, what determines sin isn't your feelings. What determines what sin is, is the word of God. And I found that the more disagreeable, the less sensitive negative emotion, the more intelligent people, they can rationalize sin based on their feelings. Yeah. Yeah. God is the one that determines good and evil, not us. God is God. We are not. So on the one hand, we cannot despair um, because the reality is that God's love for us is solid, as solid as titanium as more real than anything you could ever feel or touch. 
and his word is true and determines what sin is and what isn't, regardless of how you feel about this, that, or the other. Right. One of the authors that, sorry, one of the authors that I really appreciate who talks about this is Joyce Meyer. Um, she's a Christian author. And with something she said, our feelings are real and they are powerful, but they are not more powerful than God and truth. And I think that sometimes we forget that, you know, let's acknowledge we feel this way, even if we don't feel something. But God is more powerful. His word is truer. And that's when, when we're putting it in our hands, like, Yes, this feels more strong. This feeling of abandonment, this feeling of neglect, this feeling of not being heard or loved, that feels more real to us because it's physically with us. But this word is truer and our God is stronger. Anyway, Jill, sorry. No, I love that. I, I was just going to go, if you don't mind, to Ephesians 1. One yeah, of please. Favorite passages because it um, brings out from the Word of God who we are in Jesus. So I love what you said, Pastor Sam, talking about um, especially the Psalms because there's so much the whole gamut of range of emotions. You know, David experiences, and there's times he's frustrated, and times he's afraid, times he feels abandoned or alone, or um, times he just wants God to arise and do some justice on those enemies and. There's just the whole gamut. And um, I think we can read that and identify with that, as you mentioned, with all the different biblical heroes of faith and how they went through those same experiences. But anytime I doubt who I am in Jesus, anytime I start to slip back into that feeling versus what the word of God says, I always turn to Ephesians 1. And Ephesians 1, I find 14 things that I am in Jesus. And I'll just read a couple. I love it. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. So in Christ I'm blessed. Um, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. In Christ I am chosen. That we should be holy and without blame. In Christ I am holy. Now that's a huge thing. I mean... I don't know about you, but I struggle with even saying that in Christ, I'm holy. Wait a minute, because I, I, I'm not holy and I'm not, you know, I'm not claiming perfection. I'm not. But who are we in Jesus and who does Jesus make us? I mean, it's his righteousness. It's his holiness. But it's incredible. In Christ, we're without blame. In Christ, we're adopted. In Christ, we're accepted and redeemed and forgiven. In Christ, we have an inheritance. So in Christ, we're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And so anytime Satan comes with that, well, look at you. You think you're a Christian? You know, you're supposed mm -hmm. to be christian organization you're supposed to be representing jesus you know he comes with those attacks and then we can say no in jesus i am forgiven in jesus i am god's child i am adopted in jesus i am accepted so i just love that when you talked about the power of the word of god that's so, awesome and Ephesians 2 answers some of those questions because you have, um, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Right. And then later on, but because of his great love for us, he made us alive in Christ, not by work, should, right. lest anyone boast. So he answers that. You're not holy for yourself. Right. Uh, you are holy because he decided or he loved you uh, in order to do it. And then verse 10 my favorite verse. Ephesians is my favorite book. So when you said Ephesians, I came <laughs> um, Chapter 2, verse 10. Um, uh, we are God's workmanship. workmanship, which in Greek is the word poema, yeah. uh, which is beautiful because that's where we get the word poem. You are God's poem yeah. created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Just like Adam that's and Eve were created and were given a job we are recreated in Jesus yeah. with all of those attributes you read from chapter one. And we are, we are God's poem. He's working through his, his, his masterpiece is each of us. And it takes time to yeah. develop a masterpiece, but we are not as patient <laughs> as God no. is. We want it now. We want to have that sin removed from our lives. Now we want to have the desires now. 
We want, you know, and for us, we measure weeks. God measures decades, centuries, millennia. And how long, how far will God take you this side of the new earth? As far as you're willing to let him. That's right. But mm. he is the one that does it. It's not us. So yeah. I have um, a story which was told. I can't remember who told me the story. It's, it's a parable of these brothers who came home with two seeds and they were competing to see which one could plant the tallest little, you know, tree, whatever plant that was. And they planted it. And the older brother, it was growing much faster. And the young one, just nothing didn't come out. So two weeks later, you know, mom and dad brought them and they analyzed it and there was nothing. And the older brother, what did you do? I just watered it and, and just let it be. What about the younger one? I don't understand why this happened. I, I was so taking care of this. Every day I would dig it up. I would see the seed and I would put it back in. And it just didn't work for me. Sometimes we're like that in our spirituality. We feel anxious about our spiritual life. So we keep looking mm -hmm. and we keep looking and we keep looking. And we don't let God do the work long term. So that's, again, just because you're anxious about your relationship does not mean that it's broken. So I, I would almost say it's I don't want to say it's good. I would I don't want to say it's good, but it means you're intent on nurturing. Yes. In intent on nurturing. I think sometimes we beat ourselves up a little bit. And that it kind of has the opposite effect. You know, we say I'm not connected to the Lord right now, or I feel anxious about my relationship with him and and we start like self blaming ourselves, you know, we put ourselves in the spot and then that that brings on the guilt and the shame that you were talking about earlier. And then that separates us further and it almost makes it hard for us to, to start back and saying, okay, you know what, today I'm just going to, I'm going to start again. This morning, I'm going to make the decision to get back into Bible study. I'm not going to worry about what I did. I mean, like, obviously, Jill, you talked about this confession. We have to confess our sins and we will be forgiven. But like, I'm not going to sit and beat myself up for the sin I did yesterday. I've been forgiven for that. I'm going to start this morning and we're going to try again. Because Sam, when you were talking about your wife, you know, your wife doesn't love you because of how she feels. She loves you because she chose today to love you. And she made that decision. She said, today, I'm going to love Sam because that's the commitment I made to him. And that's the commitment I made to God, that this is, this is our marriage. I made that decision. And maybe throughout the day, she wanted to whack you upside the head a few times, you know, but tomorrow she's going to do it again. She's going to she's gonna say me she's gonna do it again she's gonna say today i choose sam again and i think that sometimes we focus so much on yesterday and the mistakes we made yesterday and the bad decisions we made yesterday and the the bad choices not that she made a bad choice yesterday to love you but that we choose again to make a yeah. good decision and start again you know i i yeah. as a pastor people come to me when their relationship is starting and breaking usually those are the two moments and sometimes it's it's tragic um but very few actually end up divorced i've got this little formula usually it works i tell i start with the husband because you know the bible says the husband uh is the head of the wife who should and and that means he should love her first like christ loved the church which is a very controversial passage and i think it's controversial for the wrong reasons right. i think the men should be rebelling against this passage because that means that they need to love first. They need to solve the problems first. They need to become more vulnerable first. They need, you know, see, it, it's on them. So I usually tell the husbands, it's it's not complicated to restore your marriage. Mm -hmm. Just take a third of your paycheck every month and buy things for her and invest in her. And just make sure that a third of your paycheck is spent on her. Like, But I don't even like her. <laughs> that's precisely the point well guess what happens within six months they're in love wherever your treasure is there your heart will be also and the same thing applies to the church pastor i don't i don't know i'm not connected to my church and i go well put your time and your money in the church just watch what happens because where you put your money and your time you will end up loving it as Jill was saying, wherever decision you make and you keep at it in your behavior, your feelings are certainly going to follow. 
It is not the other way around. If you follow your heart and your feelings, your, your thoughts, your reason, your mind may never follow after it. It may be such a stupid idea that you will never agree to it, you know, in your mind, but your heart is taking you there. That's the essence of temptation sometimes. Yeah, I get so frustrated when I hear people say, follow your heart, even Christians. I mean, how many of us are, have said, what does your heart say? And I'm like, why Hollywood would you ask a child that, <laughs> you know, because, you know, instead of saying, what do you think is the right thing to do in the situation? We say, what do you feel? Or what, is, what does your heart say? And I'm just such a dangerous precedent to make, especially with young, young people, especially with young women, you know, that they get this romanticized view of life and then end up brokenhearted and disillusioned with, with other people, with God, with institutions. And yeah, sorry, Jill, go ahead. No, I wanted to go back to the treasure. That's really yeah. um, powerful because you think about it with Jesus. Of course, we're not going to give him money. I know we give money to the church. I'm not equating that. But I mean, to put our treasure with him, it's really to spend time with him. That's how we get to know him. That's how we fall in love with him, as it were, uh, to spend that time. And you know, Second Corinthians, I think it's 318 talks about we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. And um, I used to think that was a quick beholding. What I mean by that is, okay, let, let me see. I got one verse. Okay, I read my verse. I'm good. I go on about my day. I'm, I'm, I'm good, you know. And um, my, if I can share a short uh, story, my husband yeah, Grace please. is... Um, He's just a real good steady driver. You know, some drivers are fast and they slam on the brakes and, you know, you're kind of thrown around the car, but he's very steady. He accelerates, you know, he's just very, I can sleep in the car when he drives because I just feel safe. You know, he's very comfortable. And um, he was driving. This was here in Illinois. So it's very flat. We have just corn and soybean fields. There's no mountain. It's just very monotonous, the road. And, um, there was a big pothole in the road and he turned the wheel and he avoided it. And he was kind of proud of himself, you know, like, wow, I avoided that pothole. <laughs> so he looked in the rear view mirror to see how the car behind him was doing. And if they were avoiding the pothole as well, just when he looked in the rear view mirror at the car behind him, there was a second pothole in the road <laughs> and he hit the second pothole. And so if he had kept his eyes forward, Mm. would have avoided the second pothole. Mm. And what it reminds me of is Paul's counsel in Philippians that this one thing I do, we forget the things that are behind. We press toward the prize of the, the, the calling of God in Christ Jesus. And I think so many times as Christians, we look around us. Well, how is so-and-so behind me doing, beholding Jesus? We look beside mm. us. Are they keeping up with my growth as a Christian? Like in a prideful way. Um, am I getting ahead or behind? And we look at how is so-and-so feeling about their relationship with God? Do they experience more peace than I have? Well, they seem to have a stronger relationship. Well, they don't seem to about, no. We're just told to look at Jesus. And to me, if we behold him, if we spend that time, not just five seconds in the morning, but that's something that I'm seeking in my own life right. is, you know, your day's busy and you got lots of meetings and lots of interaction yeah. and you're working on details all day and saying, okay, God, I, I need to set an alarm or I just want to bring you back into this conversation or into this mind flow. I think that's part of putting my treasure, as it were, with God is just spending that time. And I don't mean to become a monk and spend all day just, I don't mean that. But I think even in the midst of how we live our lives, we can bring our thoughts back to God. We can behold yeah. him throughout the day. And I think in doing that, that not only changes us inside, but it like puts deposits, as it were, into heaven. It puts deposits into into Jesus. And um, right. we fall in love with him that much more. Beautiful. But I think, I think too, I, I don't think, so I think too, 
talk about looking behind and looking at other people, that's incredibly important because comparing our own spiritual walk with others is damaging. But I think too, though, you know, that, that quote from Ellen White that Paul Douglas mentioned today, today was spring meeting. Um, Paul Douglas, he said, you know, we have nothing for, to fear except for that we don't see where God has led us in the past. And we equate that with, and we talk about it when we talk about the church, right? Like moving the church forward. And I think that's absolutely pro- the context in which she was, Ellen White was talking. But I think it's applicable to our own personal life. If I'm not feeling God in my life, looking back and seeing where he's led me in the past and how he's worked in my life in the past, I think is incredibly important to, to at least, even if it's not regaining feelings at that moment, it's at least reassuring me that look at the evidence behind you where God has kept you and held you and loved you and not let you fall. And when you've acted on faith, he's been there every step of the way he Mm -hmm. has continually worked in your life so when you look at your own life and I think we do need to focus on our own lives and not on the lives of those around us and as in that sense um I think looking back and seeing where God is leading us and has led us and how he's cared for us is just incredibly important to establishing that confidence that we need that even if we're not feeling his presence in our life or we're not feeling hearing him talk to us that we can have faith that he is still doing it because we've seen him do it in the past over and over and over and over again i'm sure if all three of us look back into our lives and we look at the decisions that we've made some of which we might say even say we're not great decisions and how god because we believe that they were what god asked us to do how he's honored them and how he's protected us and has brought us through to greater circumstances it's hard to then move forward and say i don't think god's leading me um and working yeah. with me right now one one change of language that i found very helpful is instead of the normal prayer that we do which is god be with me today as i do this and be with me and be with me god is with you that's what his <laughs> word says I've changed my prayer to give me an awareness of your presence, Amen. which changes everything because now you know that God is there and now you start looking for him. That relationship that Joe was talking about, you know, the constant beholding of Jesus. It's rare for me to spend even an hour doing something that I don't see what Jesus is doing there hmm. because that's I'm an awareness of his presence. I'm looking for it. I'm reading a secular book. And I'm looking to see if Jesus had any influence over the writer or over the story in whatever way. So even if the author is totally secular, what if maybe some events in the author's life uh, is is even if in a, in a small way, God was working through so that the values of the kingdom would be brought even in a secular piece of work. Um, which means that you're constantly recognizing where Jesus is in different places based on his life um, and his teachings found in the Gospels, especially. Mm. You see, the Gospels, I believe, are such an, a solid foundation you can build your life from. There is an order in reading scripture that makes a difference. I think it's N.T. Wright that makes this point. If you read Paul without reading the Gospels, you will understand neither. Mm. This is a really good point. You need to first and foremost read and understand what was important in the Gospels. What was important for Jesus? What did he talk about? And then you pick up Paul in the New Testament. If you don't do this, you will have very different understanding of what the Bible is trying to do. I'll give you an example. The substitution, Jesus' death and substitution for us. He, He died in our place. You don't find many references to that in the Gospels themselves. There are less than 10, really. Mm -hmm. But the New Testament is absolutely full of it. And our um, understanding since the Reformation is to frame everything in light of whether you go to heaven or hell. Because in the Middle Ages, they were obsessed with heaven and hell. And especially purgatory, the idea that you need to fix your own problems by burning enough so that you can make it to heaven, right? They were fixated on this. And Luther got rid of the payment aspect of it along with the rest of the reformers. But the obsession about heaven or hell was still part of that process. When in the Bible, there is a lot more that is said about how we live here 
and how the new creation that God is going to bring will be on earth. And one of the things that Adventists restored um, in terms of, of the Reformation, because we are continuing the Reformation, is the idea that heaven will be on earth. Yes, we're going to spend a thousand years in heaven, but we're going to come back here. How do we know that? By reading the Gospels first and then reading the, the, the rest of the epistles and so on in the New Testament. And Revelation last. That's an important point. Revelation is like the, the, the cherry on the cake for you to really have a, a picture of, of humanity. So if you do that, if you focus on the Gospels and listen to it, I like listening. I I don't know. I'm, maybe because I'm an extrovert. I like listening to the to the audio more than reading. But some people love reading, so read it. it doesn't matter. Go through a hundred times the four books. After you read the Gospels a hundred times, and I've done this. I've listened to the Gospel more than a hundred times. At that point, I was able to tell with precision, in at least in the version that I read, what words were Jesus's words and what were not. And I'll be able to you almost memorized every word that Jesus said. I can't do that anymore, but it helped me to ground my feelings mm -hmm. in the certainty of how Jesus lived and what he promised, mm -hmm. including the negative promises. In this world, you will have trouble. It's like, that's a promise. You're looking for promises. This is a promise. It's not a nice promise, but it's a promise. Right. Nonetheless, you will have, but trouble. there is yeah. a good, I mean, yeah. to me, but to me that like in this world, you will have trouble, but don't worry. I have overcome the world. I mean, to that's me, right especially right now like in this time when we have so much trouble and we're feeling that trouble and that trauma don't worry about it because i've overcome the world i mean that is such that's such a great promise sam it is a negative promise but it's no, such it a hopeful promise that, and it takes, like it takes the, the trauma time. right but it takes the trauma that you know that sometimes we are feeling i, I again like when we talk about right now or is that I have redeemed, you know, I have redeemed you because yes, you're struggling right now. There's war and there's conflicts and there's social unrest and there's pandemic that is seemingly never going to end. And <laughs> that stinks, but don't worry. I've overcome it. That to me, I mean, goodness, like, that's yeah, as good as when you were talking about our feelings, <laughs> that's as good as it gets. You know, I mean, that's why, you know, I think I said to you, this to you before, Sam, that my I love John one, and and part of it is a light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, cannot overcome it, can't. That light is there. That's it, yeah. because he's overcome it already. He's redeemed us. He's 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 overcome all the trouble, and that e even when I think that we're feeling at our lowest, or maybe we don't feel anything, that promise, you know, like if you feel that God hasn't forgiven you, don't worry about it. He's redeemed you. You feel like he's not with you, it's okay. He's overcome it. That's it. Like that's all you have to know. That's all you have to believe. But like, goodness gracious, isn't that hard when you just don't feel it? That's that's the struggle. That's the struggle. It is, it is the struggle. You know, I've recently been restudying um, the book of Job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it, it's just fascinating to me. Um, he went through so much, you know, you just read Job chapter one and he lost his wealth. He lost his livelihood. He lost his servants. He lost his, his kids. I mean, we say today, what the death of a child is one of the worst pains that a person can suffer. They say that it's even worse than the loss of a spouse or a parent. I don't know. I haven't experienced that, but um, the, the death of a child is just earth shattering. And yet he lost not one, but 10 children, right? In the space mm -hmm. of a day, in addition to everything else. And then he loses his health with those boils and the pain and what he endured with that. And then his wife says, curse God and die. And you get to that and it's pretty depressing. I mean, it's there's so many layers to that book we could talk a long time about. But what was interesting to me is that you get down to, I think it's verse 20, Job 120, and it says that Job was in ashes and sackcloth and he worshiped God. And I just was mm -hmm. like, wait a minute. So all of this bad stuff just happened to him. And yet he worshiped 
God. <laughs> and so it was just like an epiphany for me. It was a new revelation for me that worship is not separate from pain. Worship is not separate from suffering. I think I had always equated, you know, come into his presence with thanksgiving and enter his courts with joy and praise. And we have this concept of when I come to church on Sabbath, I need to happy Sabbath and I'm here to worship God. And yes, we are to worship, but there's times that we come to church broken. There's times that people come to church uh, on the brink of suicide or struggling with mental illness or dealing with divorce or death or health problems. And the last thing on your mind is worship. The last thing you even want to do is engage in that because there's so much pain or suffering or trauma. And yet Job worshiped. So that tells me, and I haven't even, you're a theologian, Pastor Sam, so I haven't even studied it fully to understand it. But it just tells me that God is okay with me bringing my pain into worship. And he's okay with me coming to worship with suffering. And that worship even looks different for different people. You know, I think about in Psalm, what did they say? Um, by the rivers, I can't remember by the rivers, they were in Babylon and they were told to sing and they were told to rejoice. And they, they hung their harps on the willows, I think. And they said, you know, how can we rejoice and how can we sing? And yet I, at, toward the beginning of the program, I talked about praise and the power of praise in changing our mm -hmm. attitude. And yet that also tells me that there are times where silence is okay, that we don't always have to sing and rejoice, although there is place for that. And I believe that. And I believe that praise changes my feelings and praise can bring you out of that discouraging time, like with Paul and Silas. Yet at the same time, there are times, if you look at Job, Job's friend sat down, what, seven days and said nothing. Mm -hmm. And yet there are times of silence and there are times when it might seem like God is silent to us. We ask for answers and we don't get any answers and we're still in his word and we're still claiming those promises. And yet it feels like the silence of God. And I don't have it all even figured out in my own mind, but I think when you get toward the middle of Job, he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And I think somehow, even in the midst of confusion, even in the midst of pain and suffering, when we don't always understand um, that we can still trust that our God is good. We can still mm -hmm. trust that our God is faithful. And even if we don't know the answer now, that it's okay. Even if I may never know this side of eternity, that it is okay because i know my father's heart is love and some days that's all you have to know some days that's enough i love the link that you are building mm -hmm. between pain and worship uh, because i see all sorts of connections you have the apostle paul and silas who are in the inner prison after being beaten after being shamed so they're naked in the inner cell they're their backs must have been open with open wounds, bleeding with their feet in the stalks, uh, which basically they had their feet up and they were holding themselves from the ground in the inner cell, which there were no bathrooms in inner cells. So their open wounded backs were on the floor full of excrements from previous prisoners. It doesn't get much worse than this in terms mm -hmm. of humiliation. And at midnight, they start singing in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their, of their most real experience, they start worshiping. Yeah. Because Jennifer, you mentioned numbness a few times. Mm -hmm. If you turned up to God and to worship and you try to become numb 
so that you're not vulnerable and other people don't see your pain. Yeah. That is very complicated to God. How do you worship God in a form of deceit, which is you're acting appropriately according to what you're experiencing as you are in church? One of the things I like about visiting non-European countries or nor countries that don't have such a high influence of European culture is that when people are suffering in worship, you know about it. Have you ever been to a funeral in Africa or even South America? You've got some real emotion that goes on there as they sing, even as they, it's, it's raw. They allow themselves, you know, it's appropriate for that. Numbness is really complicated. And one way I found to let go of numbness is to encounter someone who is suffering, who is truly suffering. That is one way to end numbness cold. You face mm -hmm. someone who is going through a struggle. It's good. You help them, which is exactly what the New Testament is. When yeah. you're doing well, make sure that you interact with and you help those that are not and then come and worship. In fact, the worship environment is exactly the point where those that are not doing well meet with those that are doing better that particular week and they all worship God together in this shared pain because we're all suffering with something. Um, so yeah, that's that, there is a connection there. And in the new, in, in Revelation, we're told that the people who will go through the largest suffering, the strongest suffering since let's say Gethsemane, they will be able to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. I don't know what that means, but there you go. That's that's it, Joe. You have a direct relationship between the pain they experience and the kind of worship that they can bring God. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting proposition. Joe, tell us about Gethsemane a little bit, because that's where Jesus doesn't even feel like doing what he's about to do. And he's Jesus. So <laughs> his feelings are not there. But he is still faithful. He is still wanting to drink the cup that God has for him. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I remember um, I had the privilege one time of being there in Israel. And we went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I remember those really old olive trees. I don't know if either one of you have been yeah, there. But yeah. you see those really, um, they said some were, what, 2,000 years old or something. And you imagine, what if there were little sprouts, you know, when Jesus had been here in the garden. And um <sighs> It is amazing to me that um, the Son of God, from the beginning of time, um, beginning of creation of our world, set in motion that plan of redemption. He gave us free choice, right, in the garden, that we... <laughs> we had the choice to follow his way or do our own thing and walk in the path of our own choosing. And yet the price of us having freedom, us having the freedom to choose was the death of the son of God. And um, the love that was displayed. Um, I cannot even imagine. I know those times we're talking about feelings. Mm -hmm. Those times when I feel separate from God is really painful to my heart. Those times when it feels like I don't hear his voice or I endure his silence. And yet Jesus in the garden and later on the cross experiencing that pain of separation. Now, I've only had small amounts of connection with Jesus, but you imagine Jesus and God being connected from eternity. I can't even imagine what that was like and that perfection and holiness and oneness. And then to have that, the sins, my sins placed on his back and that separation, the withdrawing of the father from him um, is incredible um, because for me, it would be painful to be separated from God, but for Jesus, it was even more so. And um, to experience that and um, the surrender that Jesus went through. Father, if it's possible, just let this cup pass. I can't endure. My humanity shrinks from this and I'm not able to endure that. But yet, not my will, but your will be done.
Mm. One of my favorite parts about that whole story, the surrender is powerful and um, Jesus willing to do it for me is incredibly powerful. But this may seem odd, but one of my favorite parts of that whole section is actually after Jesus prayed that, one of the gospels says, then an angel came from heaven and strengthened him. And to me, it shows the care and compassion of our father in heaven knowing in this case there's only so much even jesus can endure and yet at this point the father says i'm stepping in and i'm giving him special grace and special strength at this greatest time of need i don't know it just gives me hope knowing that when yeah. we go through something that at our greatest time of need that god will send help and um send that for us it's amazing how God is unbelievably kind to us. It's not just that he loves us. It's not just that he He is good to us. He's kind to us. That is shown by the, what you just said. Uh, Jill, I think that's such a perfect way to kind of wrap up our conversation. Would you pray for us? Sure. Holy Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. And we're so grateful that we don't stand in your presence through any merit of our own. That it's not based on how we feel or um, if we think we're worthy enough, because our righteousness, God, is just nothing. It's filthy rags. We're so grateful for the gift of Jesus and the gift of salvation and the promise that we have that you can forgive and you can cleanse and we can stand before you clothed in your righteous white robe of your righteousness. And God, we accept and receive that today. I pray for my brothers and sisters listening, my brothers and sisters watching right now, who may be struggling with knowing, uh, can they be accepted? Or uh, just walking by faith versus walking by feelings. And so Father, I ask, would you speak to them just now? I ask that you would wrap them in your arms and that through the power of your word, through the still small voice of your your spirit that day by day you can teach us more how to walk with you more how to walk by faith in what your word says and God thank you that you are the one who gives us the victory we claim it just now and we ask all this in the precious and holy name of Jesus amen amen, amen. thank you Jill and Sam for this wonderful conversation I have been really blessed by it. And if you are watching um, and you need someone to pray for us, pray for you, please pray for us. But if you need someone to pray for you about something specific, please remember we have people praying for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you have tips of somehow you've reconnected with the Lord after you have felt separate, please let us know in the comments. We're really excited to hear from you. We'll see you next week. God bless.